I'm nothing special. You are a special guest. Uh, uh, this is our speaker. Hello, Christine. Lee. Hello, Christine. Uh, Maggett. He is from UK yeah. and he has some involvement in UK politics. <laughs> So, uh, as you know, the, the topic is a very interesting and topical one on the UK referendum on the, on the EU. And uh, I'll say a, f first, uh, say a few words to introduce Ms. Lee. Uh, she was born in Hong Kong. She moved to UK at the age of 11. 
and she is the founder and chairman of the solicitors firm uh, Christine Lee and Company. She specializes in UK company law, EU law, human rights law, as well as immigration law. And uh, for more than 20 years, she has worked uh, to promote the rights of the Chinese community in the UK and their political representation. Uh, in 2006, she set up the British Chinese Project, which is a non-profit organization devoted to promote engagement and understanding between the British Chinese community and the wider UK society. So may I uh, welcome uh, Ms. Lee and uh, look forward to hearing your Thanks to Albert and Joyce and the Centre for Comparative and Public Law and thank you everyone in the audience for taking time to come here this afternoon and it's a great honour for me to be here with you today. We're going to talk about three parts of the EU referendum, if we can get the PowerPoint up. Oh, going to uh, talk about is the political side and then also then this legal side and also the political implication to the British Chinese community. There are four key institutions which work together to run the EU. The European Commission, the European Parliament and the European Council and the European Court of Justice. Watch this video to find out how they all fit together and what they do. That's simple, that's how EU works. <laughs> Why have a referendum? It is felt that in UK that any political decision that is so fundamental that it goes to the core of the sovereignty of the country is the decision... We need to stop YouTube. We like the YouTube. Uh, YouTube is still YouTube running. So 
we start again? Why have a referendum? It is felt that in UK that any political decision that is so fundamental that it goes to the core of the sovereignty of the country is a decision that should be taken by the whole nation rather than merely the elected representatives. This was the same reason why in 2014 there was a referendum in Scotland about remaining as part of UK. It is thought to be more or less once in a lifetime a chance to change the fundamental constitutional position. If UK fought to remain, it is unlikely there will be any about turn for at least another generation or even longer. If UK folks to leave, there would be no turning back from, this, from that decision. So who decide there should be a referendum? In short, this was a political decision taken by the Conservative Party led by David Cameron as part of their manifesto pledges leading up to the general election. In UK from 2010 onwards, the traditional political party Conservative and Labour, well, Lib Dem, you can, you can put that in as well, were being challenged by a new party called the UK, UK Independent Party, led by Nigel Farage. Their party, their main political aim is to bring UK out of EU, arguing it is holding UK back. A lot of people in UK see this party as close to racist. And one of their main arguments has always revolved around immigration. Some of their supporters would like to stop immigration altogether. Some of their supporters would like to stop the immigration, but nevertheless, the last few years, there has been a very, very strong voice rise up from the UKIP, the UKIP. Even though they have only one MP sitting, one MP in the UK, UK. Irony, they are politically stronger within the EU with several UKIP European MPs. This strong rise played a large part in Cameron's decision. He felt that Europe issue should be decided once and for all in the hope that it would consolidate the electorate support for the Tories at the expense of UKIP. He therefore pledged in 2015 that he would hold a referendum by 2017 at the latest. The question for you, does he now regret this decision? <laughs> it is too early to say for sure. However, it is clear that the campaign up to now has been nowhere near as clear cut as Cameron was expecting. The Remain vote, according to opinion polls, will probably just about do enough to win. But there are very many undecided voters in UK, and a bad couple of weeks, the next couple of weeks, for Cameron, now could still tilt the vote in favour of Brics. That is Britain exit Brics. Has this been a bad political decision by Cameron? Probably yes. Even if Remain wins, the campaign has had the effect of dividing the two main parties eternally. But these divisions are much clearer in the Tory party. Leading Conservatives have come out in favour of leaving, the two highest profile being Michael Gove and Boris Johnson. And it is thought by many that if they are successful, Cameron could not survive. And these politicians, especially Boris, would see this as a springboard towards a pitch for the Tory leadership. Of course, Boris denies this is the case, but in fact, remains that he would be much stronger politically if he was seen as the leading supporter of the winning seat. So therefore, even if remain wins, it is likely to be a close vote and many pundits feel Cameron would still be vulnerable because of the clear breaks which have emerged in his party. It should be remembered, however, that Cameron has publicly stated 
he will not stand for another term as prime minister anyway. So a leadership battle is added sooner or later. It needs to be understood that in the UK, the public do not directly vote for the position of a prime minister. The prime minister is not an elected post. The vote is for their local MPs and by convention, the party that gains the most MPs are invited from the government to form a government. And the leader of that party then, come, then becomes the prime minister. Furthermore, if the government party ex expresses through their MPs a vote of no confidence in the prime minister during the term of government, then that party can vote for a new leader. Who will then become prime minister? This happened when John Major took over from Margaret Thatcher in the 1990s. It is only at the next general election, every five years, that the general public has a say. And then only indirectly, as mentioned before, by voting for the local MP. So how impressed are the UK public? Anybody from UK actually? Oh good, can I ask you this question then? How impressed are you? Profoundly unimpressed because the current generation of politicians <coughs> are the acumen and depth. Well, they're not quite as bad as the members of parliament in Ukraine regularly attack each other with knives and swords and things in parliament, but they're not far from it. Which is, basically, it's, a, it's something that's developed over the last 20, 30 years. You've just got collections of people who are packaged by PR men and PR women on the outside who have no innate abilities. And I speak as somebody who knows lots of MPs, and some of them are okay, but the ones at the top are incompetent. And the public are quite rightly sick to death of them. But also, they're also sick to death of them because they see them as being impotent, as, as not having an influence. And that's one of the, not the immigration point, it's the lack of control because of globalization, which the U.S. part, that's actually it's the same thing that's happened in the US, is driving the anger of electorates. Some electorates here as well, it's the same thing. We are powerless. And now they're seeing that because they can't hide behind their party um, disguises in a referendum. You stand upon your own. And they've been shown up for it. Great. So how impressed are the UK public? In short, not very <coughs> impressed. As state before, there are a great number of undecided voters. What they need is a proper balanced argument on the pros and cons of leaving or staying. They've got plenty of that, but they're not interested. This is an emotional decision, that yeah. route. But to a lot of general public, it's, this is They'll not tell happening. you that. Yes. They'll say that, because that looks reasonable. My sister's like that. <laughs> <laughs> I say to her, Stephanie, I say, there are no facts in this. There are no real facts. No, no, you've got to decide on your gut feeling. That's true. Instead of both sides are treating the campaign much as they would a campaign leading to a general election. I was in the, I was helping with the general election 2015. In other words, there is much scaremongering going on and in some cases, it's not even known if the facts and statistics quoted are even true. By way of example, the Brexit campaign has gone round UK in a big bus with a slogan on it claiming the members of EU causes UK 350 million per week. But this is misleading and only partially true. It ignores the substantial refunds that are paid back to UK by the EU, thanks to Margaret Thatcher for the rebate. Immigration has become a key issue, like the gentleman just said, which is probably inevitable because it will always be an emotive topic in the UK. BRICS are now running their campaign largely on the fear factor that UK will be overrun by EU immigrants. And there is nothing we can do to stop it, they say. Who will take all the jobs, school, homes, 
They are pointing at Cameron's target figures for immigration, which are not close to be achieved. The Remain Group countered this by pointing at the essential jobs that are carried out by migrant and the UK social responsibility and the enrichment of the country being multicultural. Even Boris Johnson, who, when he was a mayor of London, showed sympathetic <coughs> immigration view, is now, is now sharing much political opinion with the more radical UKIP campaigners. Many members of the public do not therefore feel they are being shown a balanced argument which would help them make a reasoned voting decision. So there's still a lot of undecided voter out there. So which side is going to win? Any guess? I got on. It depends on turnout, actually, more than anything else. Young this people, is only one of the poor kids. Yeah, that's all the on it. If that's a poll <coughs> of basically a 2% lead for remain, depending on the turnout, if the turnout's below 60%, the actual result would be a win for leave because younger people are more pro staying in, but they are not pro to voting. It's an interesting story. Earlier this week, it was reported that Facebook had managed to get 100,000 more people registered to vote. They're probably overwhelmingly young people. That could make a difference because every vote counts in the referendum. If the turnout's above 60, 65%, that will probably be the result, or maybe slightly better for Remain, but it depends on, it's all about differential turnout. Older people are anti-EU and are more likely to vote because young people are more interested in going to things like Glastonbury, which is on <laughs> the same people who vote, and they're too daft to get themselves postal votes. This is a fact. Which side is going to win? The vote is too close to call, like you say. Some recent opinion polls have for the first time put the Leave campaign ahead. We didn't, we, we managed to get this Remain ahead. And others, lots of others, put Remain ahead. But the basic UK mindset is cautious. And so fear of the unknown, I think I'm the fear of unknown, can properly sway the folk to remain in the undecideds. UK is the fifth largest economy in the world, and unemployment an, an figures in the UK are the lowest for decades. And there is a general feeling that the country is doing well. So therefore, if all this can be achieved from within the EU, then many will feel that there's no point in risking the, the abilities by voting to leave and start negotiating, negotiating with different countries and might not come off anything. So, we don't know. How do I vote? How do you vote? It's a secret ballot. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I had a little bit of argument uh, with uh, some authorities today, this morning, when I was on the, uh, where were Radio, Hong Kong. Radio Hong Kong, sorry, I, I, I'm not from Hong Kong, so therefore I didn't know which radio I was in. And is this, uh, you probably heard of who would be able to vote? Obviously British, Irish, and Commonwealth citizen over 18 who are residents in the UK. UK national, UK national could be British Hong, uh, British Hong Kong national because there's 50,000 of us here. And uh, living abroad who have been on the electoral register in the UK in the past 15 years, only in the past 15 years. Citizens from EU countries, apart from Ireland, Malta and Cyprus, will not get a vote. The EU citizen is not going to get a vote. But, listen to this, not everybody agrees with me, but we're still arguing. Uh, Hong Kong British national overseas can vote if they are registered on the electoral register in the UK. I mean, you're all lawyers here. I mean, all you need to do is have a, have a look at the 1985 Act, then you would know that, yes, the BNO can vote, but they have to be registered on the electoral register in the UK. But I was told that they are not allowed to vote today. So I, I got a little bit, a little bit challenging to do, but... How would, sorry, how would they actually register them? Because you have to register in the constituency then. So. Well, it's, it's, it's like this. A lot of... Um, uh, 
British national overseas is already student in UK. Uh, so what they do is as soon as they enroll in, um, in the resident yes. hall or, or they enroll in the uh, temporary uh, rental house, the local council would have registered them. And as soon as they can prove that they are BNO, they are, they are already, uh, they would be sent send the, uh, the, the full card. But anyway, we were told this morning that British national office have no right to vote. So we're, we're going to challenge that very soon. So registers to vote, uh, I'm sure you all know, go to www.gov.uk slash register to vote. Once you are registered to vote, there are three ways. One, you go back to UK and do it in person from 7 to 10, 23rd of June, or by post. I, unfortunately, is now deadline's gone, 8th of June. But by proxy, the deadline, somebody was telling me today that they, are, they have done it today. By proxy, the deadline is 5 p.m. on 15 of June 2016. So please, we still got time <coughs> for proxy. Get your, get your family and friends to do it for you. Okay, let's, let's look at part two now. In or out from the legal perspective. Sovereignty is the issue dominating the EU referendum campaign. But how much does the EU limit Britain's ability to make its own choices? How does EU membership constrict Britain's ability to have decision taking, policy set, and laws made by people who are directly accountable for those choices to the British people at the ballot box. And perhaps more importantly, if the nation voted to leave on the June 23rd, how much sovereignty will we reclaim if we left? Michael Goh was saying in one of the interviews that as soon after the 23rd of June, they're going to take back the sovereignty straight away on the 24th. So let's look at the act. In, uh, in, the, in the 1972 Act, Supremacy of EU Law. When the Parliament passed the European Community Act 1972, it implicitly recognised the primacy of EU law over UK law. So they are right. I mean, there is this problem. I mean, if you call it problem. I mean, to the British Chinese people, there's no problem. I will explain to you why. But yes, for the mainstream society, there's a big problem. If, especially when you're a lawyer, you want, you want your own power. A principle that over the following decade was deepened and extended by the decision of the EU's top court, the European Court of Justice, ECJ. Recently, there has been pushed back by EU member states following years of so-called judicial activism by the ECJ. According to Professor of European Union Law at the London School of Economics, EU law now takes precedent unless Parliament expressly says this is not the case or British court believe that the EU has exceeded its power. A so-called sovereignty bill currently being considered could also set out further circumstances when EU legal authority should be restricted. This could include giving the UK Supreme Court a mandate to test whether EU court is exceeding its own competency. So this is the 1972's act. Excuse me, but didn't the 1972 act do everything? In other words, all Parliament has to do is pass another act. Yes, but they didn't- Contradicting it. What, what's happened is, in the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, mm. they even, instead of taking the power back to our own state, they have given even more power to the, to the uh, Commission and also to the court. When you say they, who do you say? European, uh, EU, European no, but My point is that the UK Parliament is supreme within Britain. It just passes the law. Yeah, that's what they're going to do. David Cameron yeah. is suggesting the Bill of Rights but they can't really do anything. I'll explain more when, when we get to it. Okay, the European Court of Justice. The Court of Justice is based in Luxembourg. The 28 judges rule on matters of union law as it is laid down in the treaties and can arbitrate in dispute between major states and on those between the commission and member states. 
And like you say, you can actually go to European court and argue if you were uh, the, the MEP. Nigel Farage has been doing that all the time. Go to the European Court or the European Parliament? No, he's the uh, MEP. He's yeah. the uh, European Parliament. Yeah. So because of the um, Lisbon Treaty, so he's given more, instead of a talking shop, he's been given more power to talk. And we got 73 seats, so therefore it was, you know, he was able to say something in the European. Whether it's appropriate or not, it's a different matter. And what happened is that the dispute between uh, major states and all those between the Commission and Member States. It can even fines on those states found to be a, in breach of union law and those which do not carry out treaty obligation. And this is the European Court of Justice. Let's look at the European Convention on Human Rights. The European Convention on Human Rights, ECHR, which we use a lot for the British Chinese, is an international treaty to protect human rights and fundamental freedoms in Europe. Formed by the Council of Europe, the Convention Centre into a force on September 1953. All Council of Europe member states are party to the Convention and new members are expected to ratify the Convention at the earliest opportunity. Britain, for all you know, was an early signatory of the document and from 1965, its citizen had the right of access to the European machinery. This meant that although the convention was not part of the British Britain law, citizens who felt that their rights had been denied could take their case to Strasbourg to gain redress and possibly compensation. The European Convention is not part of the European Court of Justice and should not be confused with the European Union. UK membership to this convention would therefore continue irrespective of the vote, although there's a conservative pledge to introduce, like you say, change of um, act, introduce new human rights legislation called the Bill of Rights, which... Can I just interrupt? Bill of Rights, though, will not... Well, the thing is, it wasn't originally introduced into legislation. The HRA, as you both know, introduced, one of the most way to put it, the, the Convention into UK law. The so-called British Bill of Rights, and there are many people who say, including many Conservatives, lawyers, including former Attorney General Donnie Grieve, say it would be absolute nonsense. Uh, I am to agree with Mr. Well, Blair. I agree with him because the well, whole well, point, anybody who whole point of lawyers, Tony Blair putting the East, putting the well, um, that was Tony Blair's fast side his bid to become President of the European Union when he stood down and retired because the Iraq War stopped that happening. Um, <laughs> the thing about the ECHR, though as you might well come to, to actually join the EU, you have to be a signatory to it as well, uh, which is causing trouble in Hungary, because Hungary doesn't like human rights very much. But it's just prime ministers at the moment. So, you know, you've got these things going on in lots of other countries, not just in the UK. Yeah, yeah, everybody is um, worrying about it. So although there's a conservative pledge to introduce a new human rights legislation, which, if they do, will also be irrespective of the referendum vote. We have to understand that if, because we have joined the, in 1965, we have already joined the, East, uh, the ECHR. So even if we leave the, the EU, we still still bind by it. Can I ask about this number of 47? So there's, there's 28 EU members, who are the other? 19 people on this. Oh, this is Council of Europe. This has nothing to do with uh, EU. Don't get them mixed up. No, no okay, so who, does, who, are, who are these member states? That, that, so that covers... Oh, this, they, they, uh, internationally, there's, um, even Russia was one of them. So it's, it's Norway is in yeah, Switzerland. So I can get your list if you want to. So that's, that's geographically all of Europe? Uh, th no, 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 not yeah, Europe mainly, but also outside Europe as well. Okay. But I get, can give, give you a list uh, later. I have, a, sorry, I, have a, I have a question, if I may. So Theresa May, the, the Home Secretary, came up with this, I find, ludicrous um, position in which she said, and this is all to do with the next Tory leadership campaign, personally thinking, she would be pro remain in the EU debate, but to leave the Convention, Convention on Human Rights. Legally, is that... Uh, 
Well, as it, uh, they just, that's what David Cameron was saying. Where he was able to go to EU and get us a package, but that, that didn't happen. So it's very, very difficult to say that um, later, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in the, after the 23rd. Maybe still uh, the way for us to negotiate. But as far as we are concerned, since 1998, uh, when Tony Blair brought into the domestic law on the uh, HRA, our judges in UK have been practicing using the HRA. And it's very, very difficult to say that I'm going to bring in another act and just wipe out your, your ECHR. And it's inhuman, you know, as far as we are concerned. Especially, especially, for, the <laughs> ethnic, especially for the ethnic minority, because I'm going to talk, talk to you about the British Chinese community, then you will realize how, how much we are relying on the ECHR. Uh, let's talk about the political implication to the British Chinese community. Um, Britain, in or out of Europe, how would it affect the British Chinese community? Any British Chinese community here? Any British Chinese? Yes, how do you think that the, will affect you in UK? I, I never thought there, was, there should be a difference in terms of my rights and Yes. Um, for some of you, it's probably you don't really feel that, you know, uh, because you got the language skill, you got, you understand the culture, and so therefore it probably won't affect you. But just let me tell you a story first before we go on to the implication of the British Chinese community. In 2005, there was a bill called Immigration Nationality Asylum Bill came into force. The bill was going down to the uh, first reading, and the first reading, the white paper and the green paper, they sent to the blacks, they sent to Asian, they sent to uh, Pakistan, they sent to everybody except the Chinese. We didn't get a sausage, as uh, Boris Johnson was saying. And what happened then, during that time, it was passing, going through the second, uh, second reading before we realize how bad it is to affect the British Chinese community. Why is it bad? What the, what the bill say is, we want the West John Turk and the catering trade to be immigration officer. They want us to check the passport before we can employ them. But how do you expect a West John tour to check a passport whether they're genuine or not, or a piece of document to say that they got leave to remain? And if they check it not properly enough, they can be fined five to 10,000 and be taken to jail for two years. Do you think that's it's fair? That's the law in Hong Kong. I mean, this, I'm talking about it. Three years, or two years in Hong Kong. Uh, it's three years. Three years. <laughs> yeah, but we are all common law. <coughs> and what happened is, on the family side. If a mother uh, or father wants to join their children, then they would have to fill in a slip to say that they are earning such and such before they can bring their spouse over. At the moment, it's probably 18,500 uh, pounds. So if you're earning less than 18,500 pounds, then you're not allowed to bring your spouse over. Until you can earn this kind of money, then you can bring it. And then there's also a students. What's happened to the student is they come over from Hong Kong and, and they did their first year, second year uh, of university, third year, they will have to renew and they forgot to put in a bank statement or they forgot to fill in something wrong. And then they would, their vacation would be rejected, they would be sent back to Hong Kong and then they can appeal within Hong Kong and then come back when the appeal is successful. And also the catering tray. Uh, what happened to the catering tray is they only allow to work for four years, and after four years they would have to send back to um, to where they come from, and wouldn't get the wouldn't give them leave to remain uh, uh, like before. As far as the Chinese catering is concerned, they are relying so much on the chef. If the chef realize that they're only coming here for four years, and then they have to go back again, they. No, no, no one's going to come. 
And there's lots more of other things. I mean, don't want to bother you with all the all the rules that affect the British Chinese community. But when we actually told the British Chinese community for the very first time, the Chinese community up and down the country got together and start peti petitioning the uh, UK government. The bill has gone through to uh, the third stage and then passed back to the House of Lords. And at that time, we have a Lord called Lord Chan. And we went to Lord Chan and explained to him the situation. And a Lord Chan said to me, we have never had any Chinese voice in House of Lords before. You're the first Chinese community to come forward. So we weren't even, we, we didn't even have any voice, let alone, let alone uh, trying to change the rules. At that time, Lord Chang was saying to me, it's no point to just tell me what's happening. You've got to go out to get the national Chinese community together and get their, um, each individual's problem and write a dime and send the letter to your MP. So then we were exercising our demo democratic rights by writing to the MP. So within six weeks, 650 MP received a letter from their own constituency, a Chinese member. They said that all the MP, well, all got my name in it, Christine Lee. So they all, the MPs start calling me and say, we don't know that we have such a large Chinese community in our area. And the reason being is that we, as a Chinese community, for some reason, are just very quiet and we don't seem to want to bother anybody. And we just felt that if we can cope, we do it ourselves. But it's getting into the stage that we cannot cope. So what happened then, we formed um, an alliance with all the different parts of Chinese community. And we found out that the most problem with the Chinese community is their language. The first generation, my dad's generation, they came here from uh, new territories and they got very limited education, so therefore they weren't able to express their needs to the government. So when you don't have a voice, your local government do not see, do not see anything. You don't vote, you don't vote locally, you don't vote nationally, you don't, vote, you don't have a voice. So therefore, all the other ethnic minority, minority got a much bigger voice. They would have got all the resources from the local government, and then the Chinese people get nothing. So as far as the law is concerned, how does the ECHR protect us in the British Chinese community? I've been, I've been using a lot of ECHR law. For example, the wife and um, the spouse case. Have you heard of Surrender Singh Principle? I'm sure you have. You, you should have heard about Surrender Singh Principle. Is that if the domestic law is not happy uh, with the application because the money is not enough, uh, can cope with the, uh, the family that stipulated by the uh, UK government, what we can do is, as a British citizen, we can get our spouse to work in another country with us, with the British citizen, exercise our easy rights for six months, and then bring our spouse back to UK again under the EU community law. So that way, we are able to, to have the family reunion cases. So go back to the political implication to the British Chinese community, Britain in or out of Europe. One of the core principles of the EU is a freedom of movement. This right enables every European to safely and freely travel to study, to work, set up business through other EU countries without the requirement of a passport. Chinese people, like so many others, have taken advantage of this. For many Chinese companies, um, I'm talking about China, Chinese companies <laughs> from mainland and Hong Kong, the UK has long been seen as an excellent springboard into European market as they find the UK proximity and time zone benefit hard to resist. It is by far the largest recipient of Chinese foreign direct investment in Europe. Good news for the Chinese, uh, British Chinese. China signed 30 billion pounds worth of commercial deals with Britain. What's it to do with British Chinese? 
The British Chinese business are at the forefront to economic advantage due to having the membership of the EU, the language skill, and understanding of both East and Western culture. It is felt by many that such investment would be less likely to continue if UK lost its membership. As far as the business concerned, they just see the big market of 500 million people, then go. 60 million, so you know, that's how business look at things. Within the last two years, the UK has taken previously unseen step to foster closer links with China. Just last year, it was announced that Britain would be the first country outside of China <coughs> to issue RMB bonds, and the UK would be a finding member of China's Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. Last October, President, President Xi's first visit to Britain has been held by British and Chinese officials as the start of the golden era of relations and has encouraged the British Chinese community to conduct more business with China and Europe. Britain has made visionary choice to become China's best friend. The Chinese president speaks in glowing terms about the prospect of closer ties between London and Beijing, potentially become even closer to China if we remain in EU. For the British Chinese... Did he say specifically it's conditional on you staying in the EU? No, of course not. You know, when well, they, this, is, this is bilateral, isn't it? Yeah, 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 Britain bilateral. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing to do with the EU. Well, the China would see Britain as a part of EU. They don't see just Britain as Britain. Do you know what I mean? They see the big picture as 28 countries as a whole. That's how they see it. Yeah, but they know there's, the, the, there's a referendum, so that might not no, no. <laughs> <laughs> They know a lot of things, and they think a lot of things, but what they see is not, you know... So uh, I mean, think, that's the cultural difference. Do you think that when this happens, they weren't looking a year ahead yes. to say this is all about? Well, they, they put can't. it this way: they won't be queuing up to do business with um, with Britain. Why not? Why not? Because so just pull they, out already, they, like because they already <laughs> invested thirty how much thirty billion pounds to us already. I mean, they're not going to seeing that we are we have been separated. They're not going to rush and say, "I'm going to give you extra more money." You Why know? not? Because it's not the way you they... You told us it's the fifth biggest economy in the world. Yes. But it's also got international connections yes. all around the world, but not just with Europe. you and me and everybody else in this room do not know what is going to happen after yes. the 23rd of June. Yes. Let's wait until then, then see what the Chinese government want to do, and then he'll probably be very happy and running around with another 30 billion and say, there you go, you know. Oh, there's the future but is we, uncertain. Yeah, exactly. That's why. That's why in or so out, many. the future is uncertain. Great. What you say is perfect because that's how everybody thinks. It doesn't why matter does anyway because if, if China doesn't give Britain the sale of the 30 billion, it might be if Putin will give Britain the sale of the 30 billion. Yeah, oh. I mean, I'm sure it's a great thing. And then we can go to North Korea, doesn't it? Chinese it's got a different mindset from Hong Kong people. Hong Kong people in Hong Kong is native. We British Chinese people are ethnic minority in Britain. So if China doing well, we are too because our faith is Chinese. Doesn't matter how good we speak English. And my son, he looks completely English uh, because I'm married to an English uh, uh, lawyer. And he says to me, Mom, I'm going to Tsinghua. I say, what for? Because he can't speak a word in Chinese. I says, I'm going to find my roots. <laughs> I say, what roots? My Chinese roots. I say, but nobody recognizes you as Chinese. It doesn't matter. I mean, you're Chinese, so I'm half Chinese. So even a young boy can understand to go to China, you know, to, to find the roots. So we British Chinese, we British Chinese now feel it's the time for us to do good business in, in, um, in Britain. Business, I don't mean just, I mean more like, a, you know, it, it's family orientated business because a lot of British Chinese business is family business. So to protect our family, to protect uh, uh, what we got now, 
I think we British Chinese people uh, really want to just remain in the EU just to be on the safe side. But whatever to be or not to be in Europe, this is a question, yeah? It's nothing to do with me, it's all, all of you to decide. But whatever the result of the referendum, it must be understood that the vote on whether to remain a member of EU is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is, uh, I think, the most uh, interesting talk, uh, and uh, it uh, stimulates, stimulates us to think about these uh, important issues for the UK uh, and the uh, Chinese community. Uh, we, we, we here in law school, our students study a lot of uh, English law, common law, but I think few students are familiar with these uh, issues of uh, EU membership. Uh, EU law is not taught in our <laughs> law school, unfortunately. It's also Hong Kong U space. Hong Kong U space teacher on part of the CPA course. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately... Uh, I, teach, oh, I teach EU law. Yeah. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, so do you not think Maastricht Treaty is the one of the best piece of legal <laughs> Oh, yeah, I read it every night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one of my teachers said the only act one is 19. <coughs> no, no, the Maastricht Treaty is I now. think Maastricht Treaty have changed our lives you know, to the better. Oh, the three pillars and then two of the pillars the disappear. Single market. <laughs> the single so, market. Well, the single market predated the Maastricht Treaty. That was the um, single European Act. Yeah, anyway, uh, that's so, the right since, since, uh, <laughs> so would you like uh, to collect a few questions before you respond or do you want to answer question by question? Yeah, um, I, actually I got another... another yeah. um, so so uh, maybe we'll collect three questions first and so then do you want to uh, ask uh, Christine to respond. This question. Uh, so you, there was a slight asymmetry in what you said about with, whether it goes uh, one way or the other from once in a lifetime opportunity. You said that if, if we remain, it won't be revisited for another generation. And if we leave, That's we're out. If we do leave, will I have a chance in 40 years' time to vote again? If you're the MP and if you're the Prime Minister, <laughs> then you can change the, you know, start negotiating with so the EU and trying to. If you're the Monet, if you're the old Monet again, then yes, start negotiating. And if you are Harold Wilson, then you start negotiating. It's very, very difficult if you have a nasty divorce that you expect your, um, your, the other half to take you back. I mean, look at this, look, just look at the history. When the um, coal and steel, the European Union, oh, sorry, uh, European Economic uh, Common Market was formed, Britain was invited to join. And what do we do? We say no. And when we say no, how many times did they block us? Two times. And only back, and only when um, uh, Edward Heath, he, you know, to, to bring the, the back in again, and Harold Wilson took it, took it back. So it's not as easy as what you think, that, oh, I can you know, always join when I'm get old, getting older, or my next generation can. Once you leave it, you're breaking 27 countries' heart. I mean, how do you expect the 27 <laughs> country to, uh, to, to... 40 years to time, I'll be the Holy Roman Empire again anyway, so... Uh, any other question? <laughs> yes, please. Um, if Britain does decide to leave the EU, and that's a position I, a scenario I hope doesn't happen, yes. um, <laughs> there'll be a lot of lawyers that surely Will do quite well in terms of being able to. How do you? How? What will the next steps be in terms of disentangling the different? Oh, are you e saying that to leave or remain? To leave. So if okay. if if you once can, you leave, um, but and the laws, the EU laws versus the UK laws, which are, I think the average average person in the UK is not familiar with some of the the differences and how you can sort of separate separate them to what? How would that? How would legally, how does that yeah, happen? Because, yeah, I understand what you mean. Okay, let's look at the two, um, the European Court of Justice and also the ECHR first. As I said before, ECHR, so we already signed with them and nothing to do with EU, so we still bind by it. Doesn't matter whether we leave or stay, we still bind by it, okay? So we leave that aside. On the, on the European Court of Justice, uh, what if we leave, 
we got two years gap to sort everything out. So during this two years, well, according to Michael Gove, he, he's going to just stop, you know, and, and take back our power and take back our sovereignty and take back everything, you know, the next day. But to be honest, at the moment, the 70% of law is uh, done by EU. So to take it back immediately, it's almost impossible. So it's, there's going to be a lot of negotiation and, and things going on. But if we leave the EU, then the politician is going to be very, very busy. I don't know whether David Cameron is going to be leading it or not but by then, but you know, they would have a group of people just to sit down and trying to sort out everything with the other side. And it's going to be a long, long-winded. Um, I have a supplementary question. You mentioned that uh, the European Court of Justice uh, uh, is plays an important role at the moment uh, in the UK legal system. Uh, and then there's the European Court of Human Rights. So, uh, will the will uh, leaving EU affects the human rights protection? Uh, uh, yeah, because, uh, uh, because you, you say that well, the European Convention of Human Rights will still be enforced. European Court of Human Rights will still be available. Um, so, are there some human rights uh, situations which, at the moment, uh, are dealt with by the uh, European Court of Justice rather than European Court of Human Rights? There's a lot of cases dealt by the two sides, but because the ECHR already it is our domestic law. We are act, our judges are already applying the ECHR in UK already. And what the Michael Gove was saying that he would take back the right, that means that, that there's a lot of money that can be came back by all the cases. And also there's a lot of cases that is still in the, in the ECHR court and it is still the same as the, uh, our domestic court. So we are still have to face all the different cases. So that's why when I say that after the 23rd, we, we can't just you know, take back everything and then start all over again. We still got to go through it bit by bit. Yes, but my point is that uh, if you, if UK leaves the UN, you can no longer take cases to, to the European Court of Justice. Will you uh, will people suffer some loss in terms of human rights uh, protection? I mean, what's the role of the European Court of Justice uh, at the moment in the UK legal system? In the UK legal system, ECJ is, okay, at the moment, the UK, UK, UK law is actually applied in the ECHR. So everything that we're doing is under the ECHR anyway. So there's not much different. But what I'm saying is after the 23rd of June, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we, we, uh, okay, 1998, Tony Blair's already put the ECHR into our domestic law. So it's already in our law. The cases we still got the judges is uh, judges deciding the cases on the merits of ECHR already now. But what David Cameron is saying is, as soon as as soon as they sort out this 23rd of June, then they will replace it with a bill of rights. But we don't know what the what the bill of rights is going to look like. But at the moment, at the moment, that's what they're suggesting. But we will still maintaining the ECHR in our court until they have come up with another act of parliament, like you suggested. Any other question or comment? Well, if not, then maybe it seems that you are also in the yes. So maybe we'll, I got lots we'll of lectures now maybe. finish and we'll thank uh, Wendy <coughs> for her. Uh, I've been, I've been doing three lectures now, and they're the most interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hope you'll visit us again. It was yes. April 3rd. Pretty good. Thanks. Didn't ask any questions.
my house. You know how many you see I stood in the Cast Selections twice again, I stood in places. I was involved. Friends of mine had done some. I was at the same stage as Some of us were councillors, some of us were. I tried to get a job. I mean, I stood in a lot of Cast Selections. I was looking at places just to take the box. As with the general election, just to take the box and say, you stood somewhere rubbish. Boris Johnson doesn't say. Well, it's all that. No, I go to Africa. But then come 2004. You had Ian Duncan Smith, who was the intellect of it, that plastic bottle, and it's got a great size. It really doesn't matter. Then you had Michael Hoffman, who I do have some time for, but it was all along lines of I'm Darth Vader, but for me, it was all And before that, David Cameron took over the tenant and said, I'm not to one of his other friends. Some of my friends stayed involved. Are you still conservative? Well, oh, yeah. I dated a lay, liberal Democrat MP. Lady One Thrill. You date some right right base of it. Very serious. You know, I've been involved in politics. I'm a very serious person. Yeah, and then I came here in 2007 <laughs> and I got married and you know, that was than that. 18 months old. Thank you very much. She's, uh, she had a vaccination. Well, I had a vaccination this morning. I want her to be an astronaut. So this lad's a physicist. I want her to be an astronaut. Like him. I can vote by proxy. Yeah, you can vote by proxy, is that right? Yes, you can. How do you vote by proxy? Karen can vote by proxy. What's your constituency? Where did you? I don't know.